Hello and welcome back to another episode of Show Out for Your City CD Pipeline. And today I'm joined by Simon Hamner. And I hope I did that right. Near enough. Yeah. <laughs> Was good enough. Cool. Great to yeah. have you, Simon. Good to be here, Johannes. And thanks for inviting me today. Yeah. And actually, you're one of the few people that I get on the show that are not a community builder yet, right? So where did you and me meet? Um, so some of the work that I've been doing, um, I saw Code Catalyst announced last year, so I've been doing quite a lot of work uh, looking into that, assessing it, trying to see how well it will work. Um, Amazon have this really useful site called Repost, which is kind of a community site. You can talk to other people who are using particular tools, ask questions, and some of the Amazon teams are on there as well, so you can reach out to those. And I'd started posting in repost, asking questions around Code Catalyst. Um, I've seen you were posting in there, and we kind of started a conversation, reached out to each other, we're having a chat around Code Catalyst and all that kind of stuff, um, CI, CD pipelines. So yeah. That, that's how we got together. We've obviously been having conversations on LinkedIn and email and all of the wonderful channels that we have out there. Yeah, I'm really glad. So yeah, it's nice to meet you finally. So you yeah, face it's to face. So cool to to make do something together, right? And to uh, to collaborate on something that is that is fun, right? Yeah. And um, yeah, community is so so important from my perspective, right? So um, this is also why. Um, I would encourage you to join the community members if you can, right? Um, so um, there is, uh, I think every year we have a sign up period where you can get uh, into the into the program, uh, and yeah, you get all kind of cool things, a lot of information as well, right? And I really uh, enjoy being part of that. So uh, you already mentioned and kind of spoiled what we're going to talk about today, right? So you are. Um, you, ha you are kind of another expert on Code Catalyst uh, ever since uh, the the tool was announced in December last year. Um, the tool is as we record this in preview, um, so yes. it is not available for everyone yet, uh, but you have been playing around. Um, so what are the top three things that you like about Code Catalyst? So the main thing for me is it, it's a single unified place. Um, it brings a lot of things that we as developers, infrastructure engineers, the people who work with cloud need on a daily basis. So it's all in one place. We've got Git repositories are handled in there, um, although it can integrate with GitHub repositories as well if we wanted to. I'm guessing other ones will come along later, but at the minute it's either internal or GitHub. Um, we have a development environment, which you can think of as a virtual desktop, which can have all of the tools that we work with. And the really nice thing with that is it's managed through a configuration file. So if we're working in a team, we can make sure that everybody's got the same configuration, all of the same tools. Um, that's definitely the, the clients that I work with in, in my day job, if you like. That's a real challenge for them sometimes is knowing that we've got a unified environment. Everybody's got the same tool sets. Um, and the other big thing that we're going to be talking about today is the pipelines. Um, they call them workflows in Code Catalyst. Um, it lets us have that automation there so we can work with the repositories. We can be monitoring the repositories for changes when we see those. We can kick off the pipelines in the same way that we've got GitHub. Jenkins, Team City. Um, it's the thing with Code Catalyst is it's all in one place. We're not having to jump around. Um, very often when I work with my clients, they're using GitHub or Bitbucket, so that's one URL. Then you've got a, as I say, Jenkins, Team City. It's in another place. It just brings everything together in a single space. It, it just makes the the experience smoother, more unified, easier to control. Yeah, and as you just mentioned that a few times, what do you do in real life? So this is kind of private what we do today, right? So it's not really <laughs> yet in your job, correct? Um, well, it, it kind of is. So I work for a company called Global Logic. Um, it is a li large product engineering company. So we've worked out that probably about half the world's population interact with the products that we work with. So um, McDonald's those fancy big touch screens. Um, we worked with McDonald's to help them develop those. Uh, we were working with some electric vehicle companies on the embedded software in there. 
um, kind of leisure things, Manchester United Football Club. Um, let me just check. I'm just checking it's Manchester United. Manchester City. Any Manchester United fans, I apologise. The Manchester City fans. <laughs> the, the kind of community space that they have there um, really helps them design and build that. So we're, we're a product engineering company. We also do uh, what you might call traditional consulting. And that's kind of the space that I work in. So I'm in our design and engineering team in the UK and Ireland and in the cloud capability. So my job is sitting down with clients and doing a lot of, it's that wonderful buzzword that we talk about, digital transformation. So it's how they can move to the cloud, how they can improve their engineering processes. Um, I do various things with the clients. So some of it's hands-on work. Some of it is helping them improve or implement pipelines through automation. Um, and I also do coaching as well. So I've been working in AWS or with AWS for about seven years now. Before that, way too many years working in data centers. Um, but yeah, that's kind of what I do. And I'm one of the senior consultants with Global Logic UK and I. Cool. Thank you so much for that introduction. And that's that's really cool to hear, right? So essentially what you do with Code Catalyst is also preparing yourself for something that might become big, right? So as we yeah. hopefully approach GA, right? I, I might see uh, also larger organizations adopting uh, Code Catalyst maybe uh, in the future. So without um, further ado, let's start looking at on the one side the tool and more, more importantly on the CICD pipeline, right? So um, I propose that we do not walk everyone through the whole tool of Code Catalyst. I have a pay playlist on the channel that people can watch to get yeah. some introductions around that. So we can directly jump into the workflows as this series is really around CICD workflows. So whenever you're ready, start sharing your screen and we can get going and look at and what you have been doing and what you have um, for us today. Okay, give me one second. Oops. As always with Zoom, I have to find the right button hiding away in here somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's give normal. me one second. Okay. And that, and that always share happens. That. And that's not a problem. So I'm ready for that, you know? So. Okay, cool. Cool. Then so hopefully you can see my screen. Please. I can Let's see your screen. Let's get cool. going. So um, this is Code Catalyst, um, or part of it anyway. This is the pipelines, as I say, Code Catalyst calls these workflows. And the one that I'm going to talk about today is this one at the top. So like a lot of people, I run a blog. Yeah. Uh, it's called Head for the Cloud. and it is managed by a tool called Hugo. So there are, we have those traditional blogging platforms, things like WordPress um, that a lot of people use. It's a fairly mature tool, WordPress, but the problem is that it needs servers behind the scenes. We've got to run web servers. There's got to be programs doing, talking to databases, pulling in content. Hugo is different. What it will do is it takes markdown files and it will run through and it will convert them to HTML so we can then put on the web page. So what I, I you've got in here. I, I think Hugo is one of those static rendering tools, right? So it renders, yeah. it renders them before actually then publishing them, right? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. So it'll run through. It, it, Basically, you'd say, render my site. It will run through. It will get all of the markdown files that you can find, image assets, things like that, videos, and it will generate the HTML. So what that lets you do is it gives you a really nice, fast experience because it isn't having to do things dynamically in the background. It just serves up straight HTML. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a little bit of JavaScript in there that runs things like the search, for example but primarily you're working with pages that have already been rendered. Um, and what you can see on the screen at the minute is what the pipeline looks like inside mm -hmm. Code Catalyst. So you get a visual representation of it. Um, and what this is saying is at the top here, this is saying where the code is gonna come from. So this is my repository. As I said, in this case, it's hosted in GitHub and with a lot of the pipeline tools, it, Code Catalyst will do similar things. So it has triggers in place. 
Um, in this particular pipeline, it's triggered whenever there's a commit to anywhere. I've got another pipeline for this repository, but that's looking for the Terraform. Mm -hmm. So when it sees changes but under the Terraform path, that will trigger that path. This one is any changes in the repository will trigger this. Okay. And hopefully, as you can see on that, let me see if I can zoom in a little bit. Yeah, let's zoom, zoom in a little bit. Um, and this is already kind of in production, right? So this, this tool yeah. deploys to your website. Okay, cool. That's good to know. Yeah. So um, I edit the file. Um, let me have a quick look. I think this is probably here. This is my repository. Um, there's no particular secrets in here, so I don't mind sharing those. But basically under here, the content um, if I look up an article, you'll see that we've got an index that is just marked down page. Mm -hmm. um, so as I'm writing a new post on the blog, I will create these pages. I'll put the images alongside, write the content, commit it to the GitHub repository. When that happens, the workflow inside Post Catalyst will pick that up here. That will trigger a run and then it will go through the steps in the pipeline. So it's a fairly simple pipeline. Uh, the reason I'm doing this is, as you mentioned, yeah, quite correctly, as part of my job as a consultant, I have to evaluate these tools. So this is a nice, simple work case for understanding how the workflows come together inside Code Catalyst. So, um, so I like the, the visual presentation of Code Catalyst. Yeah. Um, how do you... How do you work with the tool at the moment? Do you use the visual or do you use uh, there's a YAML format, I think, as well for this, right? There is. So yeah, if I if you'll see that we've got an edit edit button up here. If I click on the edits, that will bring me through behind the scenes as the YAML file mm -hmm. that contains the steps of that. Um, that's generally what I'm working with is the YAML, um, either in a development environment within Code Catalyst. Uh, anybody who's used Cloud9 in AWS is very similar to that. Mm -hmm. it's, it, it's Cloud9 is the IDE that you use, um, but it gives you a container space you can do development. Some people might feel more comfortable with a visual representation. Mm -hmm. um, you can see this is basically what you can see before. Um, if I click on this first step, for example, here, so there's a name there. It tells us what this step does. It's going to install and run Hugo. Mm -hmm. So... In this particular case, um, when we define this, we get to say, what kind of processing do I want behind the scenes? In this case, it's an EC2. Um, and that basically means for a step, this particular step, it will spin up an EC2 instance and run this step inside that instance. So this, and, so is there a different option for that? So um, yes. we were just talking about that. So um, if you look up here at the top, we've got EC2, we can also run lambdas as well. So it really depends on what that particular step is doing. Uh, if it's a smaller step, more contained, I haven't used lambdas myself yet, but it would give us, it, it's basically a serverless container that would work in rather than EC2, which yeah. is a virtual server. Yeah. Yes, and the most important thing is here, and I would encourage you to to try that out. I've I've seen significant performance improvement performance improvements in the workflows when using Lambda because it provisions faster than it EC2 does in this yeah. case, right? That's um, obviously one of the advantages with uh, the Lambdas over EC2s or a container based system. Yeah, um, as I say, this is just trying it out. This is giving me a chance to understand how this yep. all comes together. Okay. And there's things in here that we'll, we can talk about later. But basically, what we have in this particular step is a list of shell commands. In this particular case, it's going out to the Hugo website. It's pulling down the product. It's a tar file that we get down, so it extracts that. Um, I'm doing some setup around my Git, so I'm using... Um, Hugo has this idea of themes, the, the, how, how it looks on the page. Um, those are managed by Git sub modules. So 
I'm just doing the work there to pull down the code for the theme that I use. And then I actually run the command Hugo. And we were talking about this. This is the bit that goes out. Mm -hmm. It goes through all the markdown, generates up the web pages, and it stores them into a folder called public on mm -hmm. here. Um, yeah, it, it's a fairly straightforward thing. So when Hugo runs, as I say, it's going to generate the content, the HTML pages, and put them into a folder called public. So the other thing that I do need to do on here is you'll see that we've got the sections. There's one for inputs, data that's coming in, got the configuration, and then mm -hmm. the outputs at the top. So what I do here is I create an artifact called blog output. And you can see there, all I'm saying is, is everything under the public folder. So this double asterisk means subfolders, any subfolders that are in there, um, take those as well as the content as well. So that builds the, the artifacts. The reason we need the artifact is that I said each step runs in its own processing space. Mm -hmm. So as we move between the steps, I need to share the content from this first one make sure that it's available to the other ones. So, and these artifacts created there, will you later be able to retrieve them as well? Yeah. Okay. So, um, as, as we go through, if I go to the next step, um, mm -hmm. I've got the second step here. This is called Publish to S3. So, if anybody's used GitHub Actions, these are very similar to the actions that we get in GitHub. And in fact, we can actually use GitHub Actions inside our Code Catalyst workflows. Mm -hmm. You can use them, import them. Um, it's just that Code Catalyst has its own actions. Uh, you can probably see here that there's one called AWS S3 Publish. The name, the clue is in the name. It's going to take those files and it is going to publish them to an S3 bucket. Mm -hmm. So you see here, we have the input section. Um, ah, okay. This is where we specify that artifact I built in the first step. So that says, go away, get that artifact, pull it into this step, make that data available. And then in the configuration down here, um, it's saying, what am I going to do with that? So it's taking the path, the public path that we've got, and it's an S3 publish. So it, pub it asks for the name of the bucket that I'm going to publish this data to. Um, and that okay. takes the content from the public folder pushes it up into that S3 bucket. And that assumes in your pipeline that the bucket is already existing, right? So that, uh, uh, that the Terraform uh, operation that you mentioned earlier has already been executed. Yes, exactly. So in the background, um, I do the hosting in Amazon, not surprisingly, and it's, it's a fairly simple setup. There's an S3 bucket that's configured as a website. Um, that makes it easier to serve content. And there is then a CloudFront distribution that sits in front of that. So CloudFront is a service that AWS offer. It, it does a lot of things. Um, we can do geographical routing if we wanted uh, my readers in, say, America to route to a particular place. We could do that. Um, or Europe, we can do those things. Uh, it lets me make sure that I can use HTTPS. Obviously, these days with a website, HTTPS is kind of a given. We want to make sure that people yeah. don't get those security warnings. So CloudFront will let me serve an SSL certificate, make sure everything's happy on there. Um, and it also works as a content distribution network. So it acts as a caching layer in front of the website. That again improves the reading performance because if somebody's read that page, it stays in the cache. The next person that comes along is going to get that rather than it having to come out to my content all of the time. Mm -hmm. And so that means that next step that we see up there, invalidate CloudFront is the name, is exactly invalidating that cache, right? Exactly. That's it. Yep. So the next step that goes on, um, I'll just jump through to this one. Again, um, I don't need to worry about the artifact in this because we're just dealing with the infrastructure at this point. Mm -hmm. So what I've got is some AWS CLI commands. So this first command here, you'll see it. I'll just highlight it a little bit. It's basically, it says, go out to CloudFront, get, get a list of all the CloudFront distributions in my account. And you'll see that what it's doing is, is looking for a distribution 
for this particular domain head for the cloud. So go out, query AWS, get the list of cloud front distributions. Hopefully that's just going to give me one back. I make sure in here that I've actually got a distribution for it. So it's doing some logic just to check that that distribution exists and we've been able to retrieve it. And then it sends an invalidation. And an invalidation basically says wipe the cache clean. Um, you can see here, we're just saying everything, um, the slash star, just clear out everything from the cache that's there. Yeah, and here's where I think that um, AWS needs to play out stronger with the integration that they can do with Code Catalyst, right? So um, I would want to have an an action that allows me to invalidate a specific platform distribution without the need to write those two or three lines of code <laughs> that they did yet, right? Um, exactly, yes. So um, really and there may be GitHub actions that will do that. That would obviously be the... A, a nice advantage. Uh, I haven't particularly looked because I work with the CLI every day, so I'm used to writing this kind of code and commands myself. But obviously, for somebody else who might not have that experience, having a predefined action, we've got that one there that publishes to S3. It'd yeah. be really nice to have one for CloudFront as well. Yep. Let's see if that is coming in. So there's there's another step on the right hand side. Um, what what does that one do, and um, okay. why why does it go into a different route or path of the workflow? Um, so uh, it was for a little bit of a performance improvement. So what this is doing is there is a service called Algolia um, that is will let you generate search results for a website, and. I mentioned earlier that most of the site is static HTML. There is a little bit of JavaScript in there that interacts with Algolia. So there is a search bar up at the top of the blog. If you go to it, it's very like uh, the Google experience or Bing, uh, whichever search engine you use. You start typing in the string that you're looking for, and it will bring back suggestions mm -hmm. within the blog site for what pages are available. Mm -hmm. So what this actually does is as part of this run in the first stage, it generates a list of all the pages in a JSON file. Mm -hmm. uh, this particular step, we look in the configuration again. Again, some little scripts because it's all these aren't long lasting containers are always there. So if you have software that you need or tools that you need, you always have to use them. So what it's doing at the start here is there is a, a package that Algolia supply, um, and what that will let you do is take an ID of your account, the site that you're talking to, um, some credentials that authenticate that it's you, and then you'll see here it actually runs that plugin. So it's running a data upload. It takes that file that is generated, the index.json, which is the list of all of your pages, um, and it uploads it to Algolia. Okay. Um, and it, it, as you said, yeah, it shows there that it demonstrates that in pipelines, you can have parallel runs as well. You don't have to have everything running sequentially. Um, once I've generated the content, it takes a little bit of time to push that up to S3, a little bit of time to invalidate CloudFront. And knowing that it's going to take a short period for Algolia to take the index that I send it, it, it's easier to run it in parallel. Mm -hmm. Cool, that makes sense. Um, and uh, we also see that in your workflow and in your blog, you have um, only one environment, right? So no development, staging, yep. or pre-production environment, but directly pushing out to, to your production, right? Exactly. Um, with Hugo, I can run, you, you can run a local server. So typically my development processes, I'll be running that. Um, I am going to expand this because one of the things you do with Hugo is you're not just writing the content, you can customize the website if you like as well. So for example, um, you can have what it, like small plugins, if you want a particular uh, type of text displayed on the page. So those pages that you often see it like uh, a warning block, uh, a warning, don't use this code catalyst is still in preview. So I can put just uh, a little like a div in HTML, mm -hmm. but like instead I can build my own content types. Okay. Um, so there is going to be a workflow that's going to be coming along that will build 
a development version of this as well. So that would be looking at the branches and if it's anything other than main, that would push it out to the development site. Um, otherwise it would push it out to the main site. Cool. So um, now we looked at the UI view of this. Uh, let's have a short look on the YAML file and maybe yeah, start, sure. a, start a conversation uh, um, to looking at the triggers, right? Um, so how it, you already mentioned that this workflow is triggered on a push. Um, did you have the chance to play around with the different uh, possibilities of triggers that Code Catalyst offers today? Yes, so I haven't really used it yet. We can do things. So, for example, you could be triggered by a pull request. Mm -hmm. um, so there are options there. Um, and this is one of the nice things with AWS. They're great at putting the documentation there. So there is a Code Catalyst site that has, if you like, the developer information that you need. Mm -hmm. So you can see what all of those types of triggers are. Um, you'll see that it's just doing on a push here. There's no branch filtering. Mm -hmm. um, some of the other pipelines that I've got, I mentioned that there's a Terraform pipeline that builds the infrastructure. That's only looking for a specific branch and it also filters by the path. So it only looks for changes to the Terraform folder inside the repository. Can we look at that? Um, so when or... I'm pushing the... Yeah, sure. Um, if I hop up here. Why it was, and while you're bringing it up, what was your reason for deciding to have two different pipelines for that, right? So um, I've seen... Uh, I've talked to a lot of uh, builders uh, lately, right? And a few of them have um, the infrastructure as code being part of their main CI/CD uh, pipeline, right? Uh, but you, on purpose, decided to do it differently. Um, what was your main driver for that? I, it's basically I'm trying to investigate different sides of the mm -hmm. the DevOps process, if you like. Um, I started out with this. I just had the workflow primarily for the content. Um, I've been doing some work around the Terraform deployments within Code Catalyst. Um, I ran a workshop a couple of weeks ago, which is out on YouTube, um, which where we talked through how you could actually use Terraform and Code Catalyst mm -hmm. together to deploy that infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it was just for simplicity at the simple <laughs> point of the day. I'd already got that one pipeline. Um, that's okay. Uh, that's a fair, yeah. a fair answer, and that's uh, what happens a lot of times, right? Especially when you yeah. do something for private projects where time is mainly limited as well, right? So exactly, we've all got families, so there's limited time that we can look at these. But yeah, um, the other thing is this is a, a fairly new pipeline that I've only started putting together. So um, if I go into the edit here, for example. I was yeah, talking about the trigger, trigger, triggers. Trigger is the only interesting piece, Anna, I think, right? Um, okay. Yeah. So, so you're watching all files in the Terraform directory at the end. That exactly. Will trigger that workflow. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So any changes that come in there will trigger this workflow. Anything that I make to the normal content won't. It's handled separately. Okay, cool. Um, very well. Um, anything else around the CICD workflow that you had prepared that you would want to share? Um, I guess one thing that would be really useful to look at um, is how, so Code Catalyst runs in its own account. Um, it's mm -hmm. quite different to most things that will work within AWS where it sits in our account. With Code Catalyst, there's there's one general Code Catalyst account out there. So we have to explain how Code Catalyst can talk to our accounts. And we do that through setting up what is called an environment. And basically we'll have an environment for each of our accounts. And this makes it really nice because it's relatively straightforward once we've defined the environment to have a multi-environment pipeline. So uh, I mentioned that I'm going to be expanding on this so I can have a test pipeline with a development site as I'm creating customizations in the background, um, but I still want to deploy the content as well. So you can set up multiple environments in here and uh, you can see that this says it's the non-production side. Um, that, that's just I've taken that option. What I could have is this would be deploying to my test environment and then it would go on and it would deploy through into the live environment as well. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and what we're doing behind the scenes here is basically we tell it which account we want to talk to. So that's just my AWS account. Mm -hmm. um, it will go and do an authorization out to that. Mm -hmm. So it's basically one of these similar workflows that we see when we're working with Google or something else. It will say, I want to authenticate using my account. It takes us out to AWS, make sure we've got the right credentials, sets up that token that lets them talk to each other. And then back in my workflow, so you'll see that here, it's called Head for the Cloud. Mm -hmm. As with most people, we're not great at naming things, but <laughs> yeah, Could keep life simple. Yeah, and then you refer to that environment at the end, right? Exactly. So you'll see, uh, for example, if I find the one that was doing the publish, so this is the step in mm -hmm. the YAML that's doing the publish out. Um, you'll see that in here, we talk about the environment. So it's saying, use that environment that we've predefined and out in my AWS account, there is a role that Code Catalyst will set up. We give that the permissions that we need. So I can write to an S3 bucket. Um, I can invalidate the CloudFront cache, for example. Mm -hmm. So there so is a lot yeah. of control about what Code Catalyst can do in our own accounts. And that uses IAM permissions then at the end, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So there's one thing here that that as you as you were explaining this, I was thinking about right. So you have an S3 publish action. If you want to mm -hmm. execute that S3 publish actions against multiple environments, right? We would need to uh, somehow use a variable to define the destination bucket, right? Uh, and exactly. I, yeah. That's that's definitely worth trying out um, as one of the next things. Um, yeah, so uh, I mentioned back on the Terraform one, I'm going to be using that across multiple environments. So with Terraform, for example, it's fairly standard practice to store the state file that Terraform mm -hmm. generates in the back end somewhere. So that's mm -hmm. going to go out to a different place depending on which environment it's deploying to. So you can actually use variables in, in these pipelines um, and it can pick up the appropriate values as it goes for the different environments. So the Terraform will be looking for a variable and Code Catalyst will supply the appropriate value depending which account it's in. Cool, thanks. Thanks a lot. That was really cool. Um, a lot of insights. Uh, one, one more question. If you can go back to the workflows overview, um, there sure. was... Um, there was one thing that I wanted to 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 look at, right? So up here you have uh, the branches, right? So there's the project name and uh, the, the the repository name that you have, and then you have the main branch yeah. over there. Um, does this mean that I can run uh, workflows from branches as well? Yeah. So if you remember when I showed you the trigger, um, in my case, it's just triggering on a push. So mm -hmm. any commit into the repository, you can actually put a filter in there that will say only look for these branches. So talking about that stuff, I'm going to be doing with the, the website, the test website. What I will do is I will look for a development branch or a feature branch, and it will only trigger when I make changes to those uh, particular branches. Um, in this case, it it's set up so it runs from the main branch you can put whatever filters on there you want. Okay. And, and the nice thing is um, this gives you a history. So if I open up the recent runs in here, I can see how often my runs are happening. It tells us which commit. If I clicked on the commit, it takes me through into the repository. I can actually see what that change was. Yep, and that's that's really cool. So they also recently added the change tracking feature, which is on the left. I think that was an, was was uh, published this week or so, uh, close to it, right? I personally did not have a look yet, but it is supposed to somehow also show you the differences in the environment, right? So what did yes. you change? What is the infrastructure change that you did? And I think that's going to be very interesting as well. Cool. So um, with that, I think we looked at um, most of uh, the things that you have. Let's uh, sh let's stop sharing your screen and your screen, and, and let's okay. see if we can do some some kind of wrap up, right? So, um, what do you think is um, what makes you like the the workflows uh, in Code Catalyst and the CI the way of writing CI CD? So as I said, um, I work with a lot of clients 
Um, and probably one of the big difficulties we have is, is that multi-environment, how we can deploy through to multiple mm -hmm. environments. Uh, anybody who's worked in the space before Code Catalyst came along in AWS, we had tools like Code Pipeline, Code Build. It's quite complex getting those to work across multiple environments. It can be mm -hmm. quite involved work you have to put in. So Code Catalyst just makes that all easier. You define the environments that are there. You, show, you saw that we can define which roles you can talk to. So it's, it's just a simpler way of dealing with those environments. Um, the, the clients I'm working with, they're typically going through probably three or four environments before they get to live. So mm -hmm. we'll have a development one where the developers are working, getting their code ready to push out. It goes into a test environment where the teams look at it, um, make sure that everything works as they expect through into pre-production where we can maybe do some performance testing then through into life. So we've got multiple environments that we need to work with there. So anything. So thanks for sorting technical problems out. So uh, let's let's uh, move on. Um, what do you think that Code Catalyst workflows need before the tool can become GA? Okay. So we mentioned repost. This is um, some things I've mentioned on repost already. So because I work in regulated industries in the day job, one of the things that they're going to be typically concerned is change management processes. It has to go through an approval before we can deploy. So I said, Code Catalyst great at simplifying that moving through the environments. Uh, you could argue it's possibly a little bit too simple at the moment. It's very easy to go from your development environments through your pre-production into production. So one of the things that I think we're probably going to be looking for is some way of pausing the pipeline so we can get an approval process. Mm -hmm. um, so we can go out to our change management boards and say, yes, I can see what you've done. So um, in the pipelines, we can do test, automated testing. We can look at mm -hmm. the reports, the evidence that come from that, make sure that the processes have been met in terms of what we need before we go through into live. Then somebody can sit, tick the button and say, yep, this is all good. Go on, deploy yeah. it through into prod. Yeah, makes sense. And I think what we would need for that as well is the possibility to send other types of notifications, right? Because today we can only send notifications to Slack uh, from the workflows. And that's also something that we would be missing, I think. Yeah. Um, so again, um, if, if people look in repost, they'll, they'll see the questions that I've asked there. Uh, one of the things that we get in Code Catalyst, for example, is issue management. And again, I mentioned that it, it's the nice thing about Code Catalyst is it's unified. So in the same way that if we're working in GitHub, we might have issues. We've got the similar kind of thing in Code Catalyst where we can raise a ticket. So you could imagine a process might be that there's a ticket there that somebody approves from the right team. So we would need some way of interacting, querying those tickets. I'm not saying that's the way we would do it, but it's a possibility. Yeah, that sound, sounds like a possibility. And and I think also this week they and they uh, they managed to get in the possibility to link issues to a pull request, which I just found out this morning, right? So that's that's a pretty interesting feature as well. And I think yeah. that's where Code Catalyst will be able to play out the benefits, right? That um, that uh, AWS is preparing for us here, right? And I can see the vision of a fully integrated tool in the same way that you do, um, and I hope to to see to, to see more automation, right? To to empower developers to develop develop quickly um, as well as part of this um, project. Yeah. So I mean, I mentioned the issues there. You can imagine a scenario where we we typically working with automated testing as part of our pipelines. Mm -hmm. So Python code is is the space that I work in. We use PyTest for our automated testing. You can imagine that not so much in dev because that's where the developers are working, they need their space. But as you go through to the higher environments that if we see failures in those automated tests that we might want to raise an issue that could be assigned back to the developers working on that. Yep, that sounds sounds really like a feature we would want to get. Yeah. 
Cool, Simon, thank you so much. What, uh, where can people find more about you online? Uh, so we know that you have a blog, but maybe you can uh, send me the link later. Uh, we can add that yep. to the show notes. Uh, where else uh, can people contact you or reach out to you if they ha have any questions? So probably the best place is LinkedIn, to be honest. Um, it's Simon Hanmer. So if you go there, just search for Simon Hanmer. The surname is H A N for November, M for Mike E R. It's a little bit of a weird name, um, but again, I can send you the link as well. So um, if you wanted to share that, yeah, cool, it would be good. Thank you so much uh, for being my guest today and spending time with me to walk people through your CSD pipeline in Code Catalyst. It has been a pleasure. And no, it's been good. It's um, it's it's been a great opportunity. So thank you for inviting me. And I hope to see you part of the community builders um, soon um, when the next uh, chance comes up, right? Yes, that's right. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I kind of, I, I obviously do a lot of work with AWS and we, we do those kind of outreach things already. So I mentioned the DevOps playground. Um, I'll, I'll drop the link for that so you can share it with people. Um, we actually did a walkthrough. So it's a workshop, a couple of hours, how we use Code Catalyst from scratch. Uh, but we do other things as well. And like a lot of people, writing the blog posts, trying to share the knowledge, share information, get engagement out there with the community. So, yeah, uh, as soon as uh, the next set of application spaces open up, I'll be in there. Sounds, sounds cool. And let me add that link to the workshop uh, that you did as well, right? So people that are interested to hear more about that uh, and about the way that you use Code Catalyst can follow that session as well. Great. Thank you so much for being my guest today. Um, Thank you. <laughs> have a great rest of the day.